speaker is going to be speaking about movies. You know, Burbank is a very big time movie place, and people love movies. And this man has studied them. He's an author, and he's a, a, his name is Lewis Kraft. He uh, has written books, and he's spoken in many programs. Uh, the program mainly he's featuring today is going to be the movie They Died With Their Boots On with the Errol Flynn and, and the Olivia de Havilland. Now, we have in our memorabilia room the two of the costumes, one that Errol Flynn wore and one that she wore, on display down there from Warner Brothers. And uh, if you haven't seen those, you might want to look at them after the program. They're in the memorabilia room and in the Warner Brothers exhibit area. The um, so many great stories, and I understand I've talked to Lewis here, and I understand he's got a lot of good stories about it. So I want to introduce to you Lewis Kraft. Lewis. Thank you, Les. Tall, leaf, and slender. A man of rare charm. Mischievously given to pranks, gregarious and boyish. This quote describes Lieutenant Colonel George Armstrong Custer, who died at the Battle of the Little Bighorn on June 25, 1876. This quote also describes Errol Flynn. When film historians Tony Thomas, Rudy Belmore, and Clifford McCarty stated that many of Custer's personal traits were well within Flynn's grasp, they were right. In 1941, Jack Warner gave the go-ahead for Flynn to play Custer in the Warner Brothers production of They Died With The Boots On. However, before dealing with the film, Flynn and Custer, I'd uh, like to make a little detour. In 1996, a writer friend called me up and said he had Olivia de Havilland's address. And he wanted to know, wanted to know if I'd like to have it. A dumb question. Of course I would. And since I had just made the decision to add Flynn to the short list of people I wrote about, interviewing Mr. Havlin would be a coup. But it wouldn't be easy. In case you don't know, Olivia lives in Paris and has since the mid-1950s. I wrote her a letter. She didn't respond. I wrote another letter. <laughs> the same result. After the third letter, I realized I wasn't doing this very well. I decided I needed to change my approach. I decided to turn on the charm. <laughs> right. I began sending her birthday cards, Christmas cards, gifts. <laughs> you know what they say. All spare. You know what? She warmed up to my charm. She answered a few questions. And then she answered some more. After a while, I realized that if I found something that I knew wasn't true and I sent her to the details, that her, her answer would be lightning fast. Well, as the, the years began to drift by, I decided I needed to try and do something to extend our long distance question and answer relationship. I decided to introduce her to my daughter, Marissa. <laughs> Rack one up for craft. <laughs> Olivia began asking about Marissa. And then in 2002, she invited Marissa and me to visit her in Paris during the summer of 2003. Well, of course, I replied immediately that we'd love to visit. 
but there was no response. And after a while, I figured that she realized that she didn't know me from Adam and that this wasn't a very good idea, and I dropped the matter. Well, the summer of 2003 arrived and had almost passed when I received a letter from Olivia. She scolded me for not visiting. Well, to make a long story short, Marissa and I visited her, visited her during the summer of 2004. Back to the film. No, wait. I want to say one other thing. Just before Marissa and I flew to Paris, her last two letters to me, Olivia said, and I quote, you are bringing Marissa. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> Back to they died with their boots on. Which began filming on July 2nd, 1941. As we shall see, it is a film that almost shut down. Has many inaccuracies. And yet comes surprisingly, surprisingly close to capturing the spirit of Custer. At this time, Flynn was at the peak of his film career. However, he wasn't a physical specimen. By the early 1940s, many ailments, including a heart murmur, recurrent malaria, and chronic pulmonary tuberculosis contributed to him becoming 4F and unable to serve in the military for his newly chosen country after the United States entered World War II. During the filming of the Custer story, his sinus became the culprit. The headaches became so severe that in early August 1941, he entered the hospital. By the eighth of the month, a nervous Jack Warner informed production manager Kenny Wright to ensure that production began filming around Flynn's absence as it was expected that he would remain in the hospital for at least another week. Actually, Flynn missed every day of filming between August 5th and August 15th. And at that time, the studio shot six days a week. By the 13th, Flynn's health continued to decline. And a nervous Warner informed Wright Tomorrow, by 2.30, we must decide if we're going to continue filming They Died With Their Boots On. They decided not to shut down the production. Soon after returning to work on August 20th, Flynn left the set to visit his doctor. He was gone about an hour and a half. This visit didn't interrupt the shooting schedule, but future visits would. On August 23rd, Flynn presented unit manager Frank Madison with a schedule that listed numerous visits to his doctor. These visits didn't improve his health, which instead continued to worsen. By September 3rd, Flynn saw his doctor every day. Usually he, he left the set at 3 p.m., although at times he tried to make the appointments in the morning so as not to interrupt the shooting schedule more than necessary. By September 12th, Flynn also suffered from physical exhaustion. That day when he left the set to visit his doctor, he collapsed in an elevator. The next day, production shut down. Flynn was sick, and there was no way to shoot around him, even though the second unit was almost ready to begin filming Custer's <laughs> last stand. Flynn entered the hospital, but was out by the weekend. Until he became ill, production tottered between being on schedule and falling behind. By September 19th, this drastically changed, as they were now 16 days behind schedule with no end in sight. No matter how many second unit shots they made, they still needed Flynn the Battle of the Little Bighorn for the film to be worth a damn. 
spelling continued for another week, for the most part without the presence of Flynn, until it finally concluded on September 30th. 26 days over schedule. Originally budgeted at $1 million, the cost had skyrocketed to $1,350,000. Flynn took the heat for the additional cost. Even though it is based on fact, they died with their boots on as fiction. As such, it has been attacked again and again and again. E.S. Lou, superintendent of the then Custer Battlefield National Monument in southeastern Montana, began the assault. Soon after seeing a publicity spread on the film in the December 8th, 1941 issue of Life magazine, Luz wrote a scathing three-page letter to Warner Brothers, panning, tearing apart the film's accuracy. Warner's assigned Ennius McKenzie, one of the writers of the screenplay, to draft a response. In the carefully worded and reviewed copy, McKenzie stated in part, first, let me point out that you have not yet seen our film and that your letter confuses certain period pictures and comments in the issue of life. He goes on to say that though your, your mere technical detail is well founded, many of your general comments are way out of order. Mackenzie in Klein's, I'm sorry, fellow screenwriter Wally Klein. Their screenplay loosely followed Custer's life. But soon after production began, producer Hal Wallace sensed that something was missing. And he brought in contract writer Lenore Coffey to doctor Custer's relationship with his wife, Elizabeth. After researching Custer's life, Coffee pointed out what she considered a number of really shocking inaccuracies. A number of the errors are glaring. For example, after becoming temperate at the beginning of the Civil War, Custer didn't drink. Custer didn't become a civilian at the end of the Civil War. Custer served as the Lieutenant Colonel of the 7th Cavalry for seven years before the regiment moved to Dakota Territory. Fort Abraham Lincoln didn't have a wooden stockade around it. Custer never met Crazy Horse. There were no sabers at the Battle of the Little Bighorn. And if you've seen the film, you know that it takes place on a flat with hills way in the distance. The Battle of the Little Bighorn took place by a river. The little bighorn. On the east side, there are stark cliffs that eventually go into steep hills. On the west side of the river, the Indian encampment spread somewhere between two and a half and three miles long. There is no village, no river, no cliffs in the film. The final list of errors is exhaustingly long. In the final draft of the film dated June 17, 1941, and by the way, that's the same draft that Olivia has, Elizabeth Custer is called Beth. Coffey realized that this was wrong, and she changed Beth to Libby. By early September, Coffey's contribution to the film had grown considerably, but Klein and McKenzie didn't want to share screenwriting credit with her. It eventually went to arbitration. Klein and McKenzie won. Coffee's name doesn't appear on the film. How can a film based on fact but loaded with inaccuracy stand the test of time? More importantly, why has Errol Flynn's George Armstrong Custer become 
the portrayal that all other, all other Custer portrayals are compared. <laughs> Two years ago, I did an article on Custer talking about him through time. At that time, there were 91 Custer performances. By now, I think it's 92 or 93, 92 for sure. Even though the film is bad history, there are three elements it intertwines that make this possible. Custer's struggle with authority, his view of Native Americans, and his love for his wife, Libby. In the film, even though Flynn's Custer genuinely supports the U.S. government, he is frequently shown taking spirited issue with some of its representatives. In the film, the fictional character, Ned Sharp, played by Arthur Kennedy, represents all the evils of Manifest Destiny. Flynn and Kennedy are in conflict from the moment they meet at the beginning of the film. During one of the early Civil War scenes, Flynn's Custer, now a lieutenant, has been ordered to retreat, but halts on a hill to protect a bridge while Union infantry attempt to cross. Kennedy Sharp, now a captain, appears and reminds Flynn of his orders. Flynn says, I'm going to hold that bridge until the infantry get across. Kennedy says, you've had your orders. G Troop, prepare to retire. Then he goes, as you were, G Troop, to which Kennedy snaps, I'm in command here, Custer, just as long as I can stand. That suits me, Flynn yells, and knocks Kennedy from his horse. <laughs> Flynn and Kennedy's exchange of power for power is the spine of the film. Their relationship accentuates not only the, the essence of Custer, but his private war for what he thinks is right. Later, after the Civil War ends, Kennedy and his father, Senator Sharp, played by Walter Hampton, set up a Western land development and trade company on the frontier. They know they can get some government concessions, and one of their goals is to put a trader ship in each fort on the frontier. However, at this, this point in time, they don't have much money, and the stock is worth absolutely nothing. Custer, who is now a civilian and a celebrity because of his part in the Civil War, and they decide to approach him. They offer to make him president of the company at a salary at $10,000 a year so they can use his name. When Flynn isn't interested, Kennedy says, <clears throat> Can a man of your distinction bear the thought of living off his wife's estate? I know it hasn't occurred to you, General. It's occurred to me, Flynn says. Next, Hampton tries to convince Flynn of the, the validity of the project, but Flynn isn't interested. That's enough. I'll gamble. I'll gamble with anything. My money, my sword, my life, if necessary. But I'll not gamble with my good name. Good day, John. In real life, Custer was forever conscious of his name and the image it represented to the world. After the disastrous 1867 campaign against the Cheyennes on Central Plains, a campaign that cost a lot of money and made the U.S. Army look like idiots, the government needed a uh, scapegoat. And it was Custer. He was suspended from the army for one year without pay. During this time, he began writing for publication. It was hard, demanding work, but he liked it. He also liked the celebrity it generated. This, this wouldn't be a passing fancy. 
and right it consumed a major part of his time for the remainder of his life. Back to the film. Anthony Quinn plays the Oglala Sioux war chieftain, Crazy Horse. When Flynn's Custer, who has just been reinstated in the army, travels to Dakota Territory to assume command at Fort Abraham Lincoln and is attacked by a war party, he confronts and captures Quinn in single combat. When he finally arrives at Fort Lincoln and finds the, the dregs of society holed up inside the stockade, fearful of warring Indians, he displays his captive prize, Quinn, to them. As the mob slowly closes on Quinn, eager to hang him, a mounted Flynn rushes the rabble and scatters them. Quinn turns to Flynn and says, you give word, long hair. Shoot now. No rope. Flynn says, I give word, crazy horse. I keep my word. A short while later, Flynn watches as Quinn makes a spectacular mounted escape hanging from the side of his horse. He turns to Charlie Grapeman, who plays California Joe, and says, You know, Joe, in a way, I don't mind that Indian getting away. He's the only real soldier I've seen around this sport so far. <laughs> but we'll put an end to that, won't we? Since these words don't quite match what's in the printed script, and by the way, I didn't get the quote quite accurately either, but since these words don't match the printed script, there's a good chance that Flynn Ab lived them. For those of you who don't know what ad-living means, that means when an actor says words that aren't, aren't in the printed script. Flynn liked doing this as it helped make the lines his own and aided his natural delivery. Of course, <laughs> of course Jack Warner cringed every time he was in the dailies to see the recently shot film and, and realized that <laughs> Flynn once again changed his lines. At first, Kennedy and his father said it a sharp. At first, their, their land development and trading company was doing well. Even though it's not mentioned in the film, about this time is when the Panic of 1873 happened. And even though the company now has a monopoly of trading posts in all of the forts, they're beginning to lose money and they're worried about going bankrupt. So Senator Sharp, that's Walter Hampton, comes up with the idea that they need to open the Black Hills to immigration. Well, the Black Hills belong to the Sioux. And Kennedy, Sharp, uh, brings this point up. He says, well, we're going to have a gold rush. Kennedy said, there's no gold in the Black Hills. He then brings up another point. Flynn's 7th Cavalry blocks all the entries into the Black Hills. So how are you going to get immigration in there? So they decide they must eliminate Flynn before they announce their bogus gold rush. To do this, they enlist the services of Romulus Tate, played by Stanley Ridges. Okay, uh, Ridges, who is a special commissioner to coordinate civil and military administration of Indian Affairs. When he visits Fort Lincoln, Flynn arranges for the soldiers to perform a dress parade in his honor the next morning. However, that night, Kennedy opens the post bar, which has been closed on Flynn's orders. And the next morning, the soldiers are a drunken disgrace. Flynn goes berserk. <clears throat> And when he enters the bar, he finds Kennedy and two of his bartenders waiting for him. Kennedy's behind the bar, and Flynn just reaches over the bar, pulls him back, and bashes the hell out of him. And when the two bartenders come after him, he beats them up too. 
Ridges comes to the bar and demands he stop. Instead of stopping, Flynn grabs Ridges and begins choking him. It takes two soldiers to pull him off. But this is just exactly what Kennedy and Ridges wanted. Flynn is removed up from command and ordered to Washington to face charges of striking a representative of the U.S. government. While en route, he sees a newspaper headline that proclaims gold discovered in the Black Hills, and he realizes what has happened, and he goes after them in print. And this leads to a congressional inquiry. It's fiction. And that's all it is. Fiction. It's just a disguised version of Secretary of War, Belknap's Indian Ring scandal that surfaced during the 1870s. What this was, was an Indian agent post-traitorship scam that defrauded both the Indians and the soldiers, and by doing so, made the participants rich. In a nutshell, how it worked was, an Indian agent would say, I have a thousand Indians on the reservation. He would get in annuities, that is supplies, food, get, food weapons, bullets, for these thousand Indians. There are always a few Indians off the reservation. He'd then say, some of your warriors were off the reservation. As punishment, I'm only going to give you half of your annuities. He would then take the other half and give them to the post trader, who would then sell them back to the Indians at a great profit. From a military point of view, these post traderships were a monopoly. If the soldiers wanted something, extra alcohol, clothing, canned goods, a gun, anything, they had to buy it from the post trader. In the case of Fort Abraham Lincoln, the soldiers ideally could just go across the Missouri River and buy it in Bismarck for one quarter of the price. Since all official complaints were channeled through Belknap's office, he easily blocked all criticism. However, by late 1875, Custers and others were beginning to speak up. And in early 1876, there was a congressional inquiry into this. Custer testified in March and April 1876. He was told that his testimony was mainly hearsay, not admissible in court. Nevertheless, Custer's testimony, along with others, ruined Ulysses S. Grant's chances of becoming the first president elected to three terms. In the film, Flynn's Custer is also told that his testimony is hearsay. Only here they, they take it one step further. They say that even though it's hearsay, if he wrote it down, knowing that he might soon die, it would then become a dying declaration and admissible in court. Flynn concludes his testimony before the inquiry, saying, If I were an Indian, I'd fight beside Crazy Horse to the last drop of my blood. How can this be? How can this be? Soon after Elizabeth Custer's death on April 4, 1933, Frederick F. Vanderwater saw the publication of his book, Glory Hunter, The Life of General Custer. In it, he labeled Custer a martinet, an egotist. A little over 20 years later, David Humphreys Miller saw the publication of his book, Custer's Fall, the Indian side of the story. Miller interviewed a number of Indian survivors of the Battle of the Little Bighorn in the late 1940s and early 1950s. Now let's just say these survivors were eight years old in 1876. They were ancient by the time he interviewed them. In his book, he has no documentation, and yet he claims that on the day of his death, Custer told Bloody Knife and Bobtail Bull, two of his Arikara scouts, if 
we beat the Sioux, I will become President of the United States, the Godfather. By the way, Bloody Knife was one of his best friends and he also died on June 25th. Ten years later, Mari Sandoz, a novelist and nonfiction writer, one up Miller. Again, without any documentation, she claimed that Custer rushed to attack at Little Bighorn because he needed a glorious victory to secure the Democratic nomination for president at the Democratic National Convention in St. Louis on June 27. Well, since the news of Custer's demise didn't reach civilization until July 5th, it's hard to believe that news of a glorious victory would have reached civilization by June 27. Nevertheless, the damage was done. In 1969, Vine Deloria Jr. saw the publication of his Indian Manifesto, Custer Died for Your Sins. His biased and yet impassioned battle cry for Indians to unite coincided with the emergence of the American Indian Movement, AIM, the previous year. Since Custer was the superstar of the Indian Wars, people who know nothing about the Indian Wars, they've heard Custer's name. He was the superstar. The Indians chose Custer to be their poster boy. And now he represented all the evils of Manifest Destiny. I'd like to return to Custer's last line before the Congressional Inquiry. If I were an Indian, I'd fight beside Crazy Horse to the last drop of my blood. Again, how can this be? Contrary to public opinion, Custer respected the Indian. In his book, My Life on the Plains, he wrote, If I were an Indian, I'd greatly prefer to cast my lot among those of my people adhere to the free open plains rather than submit to the confined limits of a reservation. In 1876, he worked on an article he never completed. In it, he wrote, no person who was a member of a Christian and civilized nation could say a word in favor of extermination. The real and fictional Custer viewpoint of Native Americans is very close. Neither the real nor the fictional words are empty rhetoric. George Armstrong Custer's love for his wife, Libby, is well documented. Errol Flynn and Olivia de Havilland's mutual but unfulfilled love for each other isn't so well documented. Olivia played Libby. This was their eighth film together. Even though it has been reported, and I, I admit, I'm the one, one of the ones who reported it, even though it has been reported that the breaking up of them as an acting duo added another dimension to their performances that peaked during the climatic scene of the film, the so-called diary scene. This isn't true. During filming, neither actor knew that this would be the last film. When I visited with the Olivia in 2004, we, we talked about the scene a lot. I was trying to find out what was going through her head, and she said, I, I can't remember. I don't remember anything. Well, as the day went into night, and at that time in Paris, <laughs> night comes at 10 o'clock, so it was some time when it was dark, because we were outside on our patio, and uh, we were talking politics, and the lady is very political. Anyway, she came back to it, and she said, when we concluded filming the scene, I, 
I felt bad. And this stayed with me for a long time afterwards. About two years later, and I'm going to guess somewhere around 19, oh, it was 2006, uh, she was interviewed for what I think is the best documentary on Flynn, entitled The Adventures of Errol Flynn. And in one of the little interview segments with her, she comes back to this. And she says in the interview, after we completed the filming of the scene, I, I felt grief and loss. And I didn't know what that meant. And it stayed with me for a while and until it, I realized it was a presentiment. Well, actually, Flynn and Olivia were considered to play the leads in Saratoga Trunk. Gary Cooper and Ingrid Bergman eventually played the parts in a film that was shot in 1943, but not released until two years later. By 1945, Flynn wielded considerable power at Warner Brothers. That year, he asked Olivia, who we <coughs> called Libby, if uh, she would like to play the female lead in one of his upcoming films. I should say something about how Flynn and Olivia approached the problems they had with Warner Brothers. When Flynn was unhappy, and he knew how much money he was bringing in, he would renegotiate his contract for more money. <laughs> Olivia, when she was handed a script and she looked at the part, and it was poorly written. She'd say, I'm, I'm not going to play that role. I'll go on suspension without pay. Well, by 1943, Olivia's seven-year contract had ended. And she basically told Warner, nice knowing you. And Warner said, oh, no, your contract hasn't expired. You owe us for all that time you spent on suspension. Olivia didn't think so. And she took them to court. On August 30th, 1943, Warner Brothers distributed a letter that blacklisted Olivia. They made it clear that she was not to work in film, on stage, or in radio anywhere in the United States. Seven months later, Olivia won a monumental court decision known as the de Havilland decision. <laughs> it ended her contract with Warner Brothers. And also marked the beginning of the end of the studio system's contractual power over actors. So by 1945, Olivia had no intention of returning to the Warner Brothers lot in what might have been a magical retaining with Flynn never happened. Act of film. Shockingly, shockingly, what has become known as the diary scene almost never happened. As early as July 29, the, the scene had been scrubbed. Unit manager Frank Madison reported yesterday, after we got all set to film the interior bedroom sequence rewritten for the show, it was decided to cut it out of the picture. The scene didn't die. And almost a month later, on August 2021, Flynn and Olivia began to shoot the diary scene. It was long and involved, and they didn't complete it until the following day. Surprisingly, three days later, producer Hal Wallace eliminated the scene from the picture. Luckily, he later changed his mind. What the scene needed and got was primary source material. Elizabeth B. Custer's book, Boots and Saddles. Writer Lenore Toffee did her homework. 
Since the dialogue that the actors say on film isn't close to matching what's in the script, I asked Olivia about this disparity. and She said, I don't recall improvising the dialogue on set, but rewriting must have taken place somewhere, and I strongly suspect that most of the work was done by Lenore Coffey, with perhaps contributions by director Raoul Walsh, Flynn, and myself. In the scene, Olivia's Libby helps Flynn pack as he prepares to depart for Little Bighorn. As they go through the routine, they must have done every time he left on campaign. She wraps his cartridge belt around his waist and says, I'm sure you're the first soldier that ever became a general without letting out his belt. Ha <laughs> ha, he says. But you wait until we get that staff job in Washington after this campaign is over. I'm going to grow a big fat tummy on me like General Winfield Scott, you know. Ho ho! We'll grow fat and happy together, Olivia says. Together. You have been happy here, haven't you, Libby? Don't I look happy? Flynn asks her where, where his orders are, and she points him to a drawer. And when he opens the drawer, he, he discovers a diary that she keeps. So, what's this? My life with General Custer. Oh, darling, that, that's my diary. Uh, I didn't know you kept one. He opens it, turns to the last page, and reads, Tomorrow, my husband leaves, and I cannot help but feel my last happy days are ended as a premonition of disaster such as I have never known before is weighing me down. In Elizabeth Custer's book, Boots and Saddles, she wrote, with my husband's departure, my last happy days in garrison were ended as a premonition of disaster such as I had never known before weighed me down. Both actors strove for an unattainable gaiety and casualness in the parting scene, under underplaying the tragic undertones. The results are extraordinary. The, the scene is not only arguably the most romantic, but also the most touching of Flynn's film career. You know, Olivia says, I must have said that or something like that every time you went away. Every parting has its own fears and anxieties. Of course, he says, I often feel like that myself. But the more sadness in the parting, the more joy in the reunion. A trumpet call sounds. It's time to leave. Boots and saddles, he says. Flynn nods. Goodbye. The actors embrace. Walking through life with you, ma'am, has been a very gracious thing. After one last embrace, he exits to his destiny, and as the camera pulls back, Olivia faints. Not for one moment. Not for one moment do I doubt that the Custer's love for each other didn't reach this depth. For why else would she dedicate the remainder of her life after his death, another 57 years, to protecting his cherished memory? However off the film is on facts, and it admittedly misses the mark by far, it is remarkably close in spirit. The driving force behind that spirit is Errol Flynn's performance. He worked hard at his craft, and by the time he played Custer, it showed. 
David Niven called him a very good movie actor. The flair, an acting technique that James Cagney said Flynn developed as the years went by, prepared him to convey what historian Peter Valenti defined as Custer's idiosyncratic nature through the character's outrageously confident nature that finally grows into a loving and an understanding of the Indians, taking them against unscrupulous whites. In the film, at dawn, on June 25th, Flannis Custer completes writing a letter that he considers a dying declaration. By courier, he has it sent back to Fort Lincoln. In the last scene of the film, the tells Sheridan confronts Hampton's Senator Sharp and Commissioner Tape. He wants them to eliminate the business and he wants Tape to resign his commission. They really don't want to do that. And he tells them that even though Custer's dead, and by the way, Senator Sharp's son also died with Flynn. He says, even though that Custer's dead, you're going to hear him talk again. Olivia enters the room. And if you didn't see downstairs her morning dress, this is what she's wearing in this scene. That dress is downstairs. It's gorgeous. You should look at it if you haven't seen it. She holds the letter that Flynn sent. She never opens it. But the two men get the point. Bridges' tape resigns and what well, Senator Sharp says, the, the company's already dissolved. The scene ends as Littell and Olivia begin to exit. He says to her, your soldier won his last fight after all. The scene dissolves into a close-up of Flynn superimposed over a long shot of the 7th Cavalry as it marches to Little Wigharn while the regiment's theme song, Gary Owen, plays. It's a fitting end for Custer. It's also a fitting end for Flynn. For he, too, has won the last fight. After seeing the first rough cut of the film, executive Edward Seltzer told Jack Warner, producer Hal Wallace, Errol Flynn is magnificent. He surpasses anything he's ever done before. <laughs> Publisher Randolph, William Randolph Hearst, telegrammed Warner, Dear Jack, they died with their boots on as the greatest film we've ever seen. This is the second time that Marion and I have seen it, and it's even better than the first time. Marion was his mistress, actress Marion Davies. Warner agreed with Seltzer and Hearst telling director Walsh that is one of Flynn's best. Errol Flynn is basically remembered for swashbucklers. He made eight of them. He also made eight westerns. He made six war films. These genre films, for the most part, were all successful. For the most part, were class work. Going back to the Westerns, Flynn had a problem with himself as a Westerner. He thought he was miscast. Uh, he was an Australian, if you didn't know. Uh, he was wrong on this estimation. By the 19th century, the mid going into the late 19th century, during the most part of the Indian Wars, 
a big part of the population, what was a melting pot out there on the frontier? There were Germans, there were Italians, there were the Irish. And after the Civil War, the freed and Af African Americans were wandering out there to get out of the, the South. Flynn would have fit right in. <laughs> at one point, he even took a pot shot at himself. He called himself the rich man's Roy Rogers. <laughs> However, as Flynn aged, he also mellowed. In 1956, he said, I will be remembered for Robin Hood, but feel Custer was one of my best characterizations. Indeed, Flynn captured the spirit of Custer, both the film and his performance have stood the test of time. His Custer stands alone as the performance that all other Custer portrayals are compared. No small acting feat. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening. Um, um, before I step down. I have a few announcements I'd like to make. First off, unfortunately, uh, we don't do question and answers here at the Historical Society, so I will mingle with you, and if I kind of chuckle and walk away from you, that means I don't know the answer. <laughs> I, I'd like to introduce my friend Roy Henderson here. Um, he is, <laughs> along with another good friend of mine, uh, Fabio Duarte, as a company, Abbott Technolo Technology Consulting. Um, they created my website. They do terrific work. And if you ever need a website, I highly re recommend Roy and uh, Fabio. And if you don't get his card, I can always give you the information. I'd like to tell you a little about myself. I write about the Indian Wars. And like I said, about the mid-1990s, I decided to also start work writing about Errol Flynn. But when you have something that's working for you, you don't walk away and turn your back on it. You keep going with it. I'm under contract with a book. The next book will be called Ned Winko, Walking Between the Races. What he was was a man who was a very racial person, racially inclined, did not like Indians. But in 1864, he tried to end an Indian war. And when a peaceful village was attacked and destroyed, and horrible things were done to these people that thought they were at peace, that changed him completely. He went from being a popular white man in Colorado Territory to probably the most hated white man in Colorado Territory. Uh, the book will be published by University of Oklahoma Press. I owe them another five chapters by the end of this month. Um, I have been talking about him and I have a one-man show on him. Actually, the next talk on him is at the 140th anniversary of the Battle of the Washita. That is a fight that Custer won and is what, what is now Oklahoma. Uh, I have two performances of a one-man show on Wincoop there, and I also have a talk about this length on Wincoop during the week-long festivities. In April of next year, actually on April 24th, I think, I have a three-act play called Cheyenne Blood that will be premiering in Oxnard, California for a five-week run. It again deals with Wincoop, Cheyennes, and racial relations. One of the things that turned me on to Errol Flynn was I, in all my research, I think he was probably the most unracial person I have ever studied. And that's something that I think is special about that man. Um, I've done some articles, and I certainly talk about him whenever I get the opportunity. I didn't bring anything to sell. I have a book on Custer. It sells for 65. I hate being a salesman. I'm not going to let the publisher sell it. And uh, or if you're interested, it's called. If I didn't say it, Custer and the Cheyenne, you can get it at Amazon or Barnes and Noble. Or The last magazine article I did on Flynn, actually it was along the lines of this talk today. It was in the February 2008 issue of American History. It was the cover story. I think the title was Custer, The Truth Behind the Civil, Silver Screen Myth or something. 
it went out of print almost immediately upon uh, distribution and they reprinted it. Uh, that's Weeder History Group. They have about 10 or 12 magazines, Wild West, American History, Civil War, Civil War Times, Armchair General, Woodward, a ton of them. You find them on the newsstands. Uh, information, if you're interested, you could probably get it there. Uh, if all goes well, and when I, the, the one man show in the play, I work with my, I work with one director and we discuss things, and if things go well with Cheyenne Blood, and you never know, because this will be the first time it plays, um, I'm going to pitch him on a one man show on Flynn. Again, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to go rent that movie on the way home. Today. <laughs> I have a, a little, a little uh, trivia that might be of interest to you about uh, the battle. Uh, I'm Herb Benson, one of the directors here at the, board, at the museum, and, and thank you all for coming today. Uh, I was born in Montana in 1928 in southwestern Montana. My grandmother on my father's side was the first white girl born in the territory of Montana in the 1870s. And I love my grandmother. She was. She spoiled me rotten. She was wonderful. She'd tell me stories about when she was a little girl growing up in Montana in the Deer Lodge area, which is near Butte and Anaconda and that part of the, of the state. And that the Indians would go on the warpath from time to time. And when they did, her mother would bake, make some food uh, ahead of time at night. And then they'd take the food and the children and go out, she'd take her children and go out in the wheat fields and lay down and hide all day long from the Indians who were on the warpath who would come around looking to take care of the white man. But, uh, just thought I'd pass that on. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention was that uh, when I was a boy, I left Montana at the age of 12, came to Burbank. But when I was about 10 years old, my folks took me to uh, the Little Bighorn. Has anyone here ever been to the Little Bighorn? One, two, three, four. Well, uh, as I recall, and that's some of the years ago, uh, is a little mound and there's a wrought iron fence around it. it's about this high and there's monuments where each one of these soldiers and general custer died is, am i remembering that right from 70 years ago yes i hear a yes over here and a yes back there and that's all that's I approx to say. approximately where they are yes um if you ever get the chance to visit it's now little bighorn Battlefield National Monument uh, a number of years ago, still in that thing of tearing into Custer, his name got scratched. So it's now Little Bighorn Battlefield National Monument, and the gentleman is, is correct. I was talking about where the writing was going with Errol Flynn. I, I think I forgot to mention one thing, and I, I apologize. There is a book coming. It's entitled Errol and Olivia. Thank you. Thank you, Lester. You'll enjoy your program. And folks, he's going to be over here. If you want to visit with him or talk, ask questions or whatever, you're welcome to do that. You know what? She warmed up to my charm. Mm -hmm. She answered a few questions. And then she answered some more. After a while, I realized that if I found something that I knew wasn't true and I sent her to the details, that her, her answer would be lightning fast. Well, as the, the years began to drift by, I decided I needed to try and do something to extend our long distance question and answer relationship. I decided to introduce her to my daughter, Marissa. <laughs> Rack one up for craft. <laughs> Olivia began asking about Marissa. And then in 2002, she invited Marissa and me to visit her in Paris during the summer of 2003. 
Of course, I replied immediately that we'd love to visit, but there was no response. And after a while, I figured that she realized that she didn't know me from Adam and that this wasn't a very good idea, and I dropped the matter. Well, the summer of 2003 arrived and had almost passed when I received a letter from Olivia. She scolded me for not visiting. Well, to make a long story short, Marissa and I visited her, visited her during the summer of 2004. Back to the film. No, wait. I want to say one other thing. Just before Marissa and I flew to Paris, her last two letters to me, Olivia said, and I quote, you are bringing Marissa. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Back to They Died With Their Boots On, which began filming on July 2nd, 1941. As we shall see, it is a film that almost shut down, has many inaccuracies, and yet comes surprisingly, surprisingly close to capturing the spirit of Custer. At this time, Flynn was at the peak of his film career. However, he wasn't a physical specimen. By the early 1940s, many ailments, including a heart murmur, recurrent malaria, and chronic pulmonary tuberculosis contributed to him becoming 4F and unable to serve in the military for his newly chosen country after the United States entered World War II. During the filming of the Custer story, his sinus became the culprit. The headaches became so severe that in early August 1941, he entered the hospital. By the eighth of the month, a nervous Jack Warner informed production manager Kenny Wright to ensure that production began filming around Flynn's absence, as it was expected that he would remain in the hospital for at least another week. Actually, Flynn missed every day of filming between August 5th and August 15th, and at that time the studio shot six days a week. By the 13th, Flynn's health continued to decline, and a nervous Warner informed Wright Tomorrow, by 2.30, we must decide if we're going to continue filming They Died With Their Boots On. They decided not to shut down the production. Soon after returning to work on August 20th, Flynn left the scene. this very big time movie bit place and people love movies and this man has studied him he's an author and he's a, a, his name is Lewis Kraft he uh, has written books and he's spoken in many programs uh, the program mainly he's featuring today is going to be the movie they died with their boots on with the Errol Flynn and, and uh, Olivia de Havilland now we have in our memorabilia room, the two of the costumes, one that Errol Flynn wore and one that she wore, on display down there from Warner Brothers. And uh, if you haven't seen those, you might want to look at them after the program. They're in the memorabilia room and in the Warner Brothers exhibit area. The, um, there's so many great stories, and I understand I've talked to Lewis here, and I understand he's got a lot of good stories about it. So I want to introduce to you Lewis Kraft. Lewis. <laughs> Thank you, Les. Mm -hmm. 
tall, lithe, and slender. A man of rare charm, mischievously given to pranks, gregarious and boyish. This quote describes Lieutenant Colonel George Armstrong Custer, who died at the Battle of the Little Bighorn on June 25, 1876. This quote also describes Errol Flynn. When film historians Tony Thomas, Rudy Belmer, and Clifford McCarty stated that many of Custer's personal traits were well within Flynn's grasp, they were right. In 1941, Jack Warner gave the go-ahead for Flynn to play Custer in the Warner Brothers production of They Died with the Boots On. However, before dealing with the film Flynn and Custer, I'd uh, like to make a little detour. In 1996, a writer friend called me up and said he had Olivia de Havilland's address. And he wanted to know, I wanted to know if I'd like to have it. A dumb question. Of course I would. And since I had just made the decision to add Flynn to the short list of people I wrote about, interviewing Mr. Havlin would be a coup. Cool. But it wouldn't be easy. In case you don't know, Olivia lives in Paris and has since the mid-1950s. I wrote her a letter. She didn't respond. I wrote another letter. <laughs> the same result. After the third letter, I realized I wasn't doing this very well. I decided I needed to change my approach. I decided to turn on the charm. <laughs> right. <laughs> I began sending her birthday cards, Christmas cards, gifts. You know what they said to visit his doctor. He was gone about an hour and a half. This visit didn't interrupt the shooting schedule, but future visits would. On August 23rd, Flynn presented unit manager Frank Madison with a schedule that listed numerous visits to his doctor. These visits didn't improve his health which instead continued to worsen. By September 3rd, Flynn saw his doctor every day. Usually he, he left the set at 3 p.m., although at times he tried to make the appointments in the morning so as not to interrupt the shooting schedule more than necessary. By September 12th, Flynn also suffered from physical exhaustion. That day when he left the set to visit his doctor, he collapsed in an elevator. The next day, production shut down. Glenn was sick, and there was no way to shoot around him, even though the second unit was almost ready to begin filming Custer's <laughs> last stand. Flynn entered the hospital, but was out by the weekend. Until he became ill, production tottered between being on schedule and falling behind. By September 19th, this drastically changed, as they were now 16 days behind schedule with no end in sight. No matter how many second unit shots they made, they still needed Flynn at the Battle of the Little Bighorn for the film to be worth a damn. Filming continued for another week, for the most part without the presence of Flynn, until it finally concluded on September 30th, 26 days over schedule. Originally budgeted at $1 million, 